Welcome to lecture 26, By the Bomb's Early Light. This is part three, a focus on terror as both the United States and the Soviets will develop uh, their nuclear technology and they will extend the Cold War into full-on armed conflict in the Korean War. Meanwhile, at home, the nation will be gripped with panic and terror under the witch hunts of the McCarthy age. Meanwhile, in the Cold War, things are getting a little more scary. We're taking some moves, bold moves that we haven't done before, like NATO, which stands for North Atlantic Treaty Organization, but you can just put NATO on tests. We all know what that means. It's not like there's a national American tomato organization or anything. Um, NATO is a collective defense alliance with the Soviets. So the US and the Europe cooperating together in case the Soviets attack, they will defend us, we will defend them. What is that? That is an entangling alliance. And we've not had one of those since 1778. That's right, our alliance with the French, uh, which was abrogated in 1800. We've not done that because who recommended that we avoid entangling alliances? That guy right there, George. You know he's rolling over in his grave at this time period, but you know what? He didn't have to deal with communists. And that's why Americans are okay with NATO. Another shocking development for Americans is the fall of China to the communists under Mao Zedong. Um, we had been aiding the nationalists there, gave them tons of money. Um, Chiang Kai-shek apparently had misused funds. Truman cut him off and the communists win. So Truman will get blamed for the loss of China and it's further proof, if you don't contain them, they will spread. Big shock. The Soviets exploded a nuke in September of 1949. They now have a nuclear capability. Welcome to the Atomic Bomb Club, comrade. The United States had been in a Cold War situation since the end of World War II. But if you had to pick an official start date for the Cold War when we announced to the world, we make it Facebook official, it would have to be the publication of NSC 68, which was top secret at the time, um, now declassified. NSC 68 uh, came out in 1950 um, and announced to all those who were you know, allowed to read it that the United States had strategically deemed itself in a Cold War conflict, uh, which was not our fault, it's the Soviets' fault. This is communism's problem. We didn't start this. We didn't start the fire. Mm -mm. NSC 68 also said that the United States could not rely on fighting the Cold War with the help of others and had to be prepared to fight this conflict on its own. Finally, it also recommended, among many other things, the United States use a uh, nuclear buildup to keep pace with the Soviets. And that's going to result in an a increase in the defense budget by a factor of four um, for the rest of Truman's presidency. A test of the US's resolve to fight communism also came in 1950 in the form of the Korean conflict. The Korean War is a legacy of World War II, um, where the Soviets and the Allied forces met in Korea is where they decided to divide the Korean Peninsula. And in June of 1950, North Korea, communist, uh, attacked South Korea. This could not be allowed to stand, as the Truman administration saw this clearly as, you know, a Soviet plot to extend communism. Um, as instigators of North Korea's actions. But the United States did not declare a war. Instead, this is a police action. In legal terminology, 
under the United Nations Charter, the United States is not at war. We're merely exercising a police power to repel the invasion of North Korea. Flash forward to the end, because that's what we're interested in in APUS, um, the war ends as a stalemate, um, essentially beginning uh, ending where it began at the 38th parallel with communism contained in North Korea. Containment works, um, just as we believed it would. Um, kind of like as Snape traps the curse in Dumbledore's hand in book six, you know, of Harry Potter. So, you know, same thing. This also has a legacy of heightening tensions with China because the U.S. had pushed up to uh, the Yalu River um, and there had been a discussion of perhaps uh, invoking nuclear technology here. Um, so it's going to set relations with China back as a legacy. And of course, uh, the ongoing legacy is, of, you know, even now, our strained relations with North Korea. At the same time as NSC 68, the Korean War is happening, we get our first major spy case uh, to go public, and that is the case of the Rosenbergs. Julius and Ethel were accused of sharing America's atomic secrets through a spy network, and in um, the context of the Korean War, um, this, of course, is going to be even worse than if there hadn't been another you know, conflict going on at the same time because the stakes are much higher. Um, and as a result of their spying on behalf of the Soviet Union, they're executed June 19, 1953. At the time, uh, public opinion was divided. As you can see from the signs, many people thought they should be actually executed. They were a danger, they were a threat, they were un-American. Some people were not convinced and they were uh, they were sure that the Rosenbergs were railroaded. Anti-Semitic -Sem feeling, you know, had played a role in people's hatred of the Rosenbergs. Uh, flash forward to the 1990s, the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, when we get access to Soviet archives, whose names do we find? Um, there, it is indeed the case that the Rosenbergs were involved. Um, at the time, the United States claimed that the Rosenbergs um, had passed atomic secrets um, through raspberry jello. It's red. Mm. Um, raspberry jello boxes. And this is the actual box used in the grand jury um, uh, presentment against the Rosenbergs. Um, so you imagine you, uh, the Rosenbergs in the kitchen, you know, someone says, oh, I love this Jello recipe, and Ethel goes, "Oh well, you know, let me show you how I made it." Mm. You don't have any Jello? Why take this Jello home with you? Here's a picture of Julius and Ethel awaiting execution, um, and public opinion against them uh, was pretty strong, but not everyone agreed at the time. Uh, lots of folks thought that there was a miscarriage of justice here. Speaking of miscarriage of justice, that brings us to the uh, most garbage person in American history uh, at this time period, Joseph McCarthy, um, an alcoholic, reckless madman whose crusade against communism um, spared no one, but also utilized almost no evidence. McCarthy was a serial liar um, whose concern for the truth uh, was about as um, heightened as his concern for his own health. Um, McCarthy in 1950 uh, claimed that he knew of 205 State Department employees who were definite communists working to bring down the United States from within. The number changed um, and of course it was indicative of the fact that he had a loose association with the truth. He was not above using faked information, doctored photos uh, to smear people of communist activity. 
He escalated his um, witch hunt against communists through a Senate subcommittee, which questioned federal employees and destroyed their careers with rumor and innuendo, uh, falsified evidence where possible. Um, it wasn't until 1954 that he destroyed himself. That is, he was almost untouchable until he went after the U.S. Army and he did it on public television. People could see him for who he was. It wasn't that McCarthy wasn't being criticized before 1954. It's just that every time you did, he'd turn around and say, well, you're a communist because you're trying to stop me from my important work. But with the Army McCarthy hearings on television, you could see him for what he was, a bully, a reckless alcoholic bully who had the most loose association with the truth. And you're kind of wondering at this point, why did he do this? What was it about? Was it really about hunting communists? No, it was about using hysteria as a political tool to elect Republicans. And Republicans could constantly say they were the strongest anti-communists, vote for us. Democrats were using that too, but not nearly as much as McCarthy and those like him. Um, this was a power grab on their part, uh, but karma strikes and he drank himself to death by 1957, shamed and degraded publicly for his witch hunt. Here he is uh, trying to show the Communist Party organization in the United States as of February 1950. Um, I just imagine this guy here going, oh my gosh, will somebody get me some Advil? By the end of Truman's uh, term of office, Americans were looking for a new direction because they weren't sure that the Democrats were making them safe from communism. After all, under Truman, the Soviets did explode a bomb. Under Truman, we lost China. Under Truman, we didn't defeat North Korea, we just merely contained them. So people are looking for some hope, some protection, some comfort. Democrats are seen as weak on communism. They're not doing enough to make Americans safe in the election of 1952. And so Americans turn to Dwight David Eisenhower and Richard M. Nixon. Eisenhower and Nixon are pretty moderate Republicans. Nixon is a little bit more to the right of Eisenhower. Eisenhower looks like everyone's grandfather. Um, and so you feel like oh, he's just a good guy. He's a war hero, so you know, who better to trust with the future? Nixon's got some credibility, street credibility, as a hunter-downer of communists. So let's trust the Republicans. So this is our first Republican president since Hoover. You know, we had FDR 1933 all the way to 1945. Then we've had Truman to 1952. The Republicans are back. And a factor in this election are television ads. Um, television is the new medium of the 50s to communicate with folks. And TV portrays Ike as the guy that you trust, you like him. You know he's gonna be making America safe from all those communist threats. So let's go in a new direction. I like Ike. I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president, you like I, I like I, I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president, you like I, I like I, everybody likes I for president, hang out the banner and beat the drum, we'll take I to Washington, we don't want John or Dean or Harry, let's do that big job right, just get in step with the guy that's up, get in step with I, you like I, I like I, Now is the time for 
for all good Americans to come to the aid of their country. Vote for Eisenhower. So Ike wins. 55% of the popular vote. That's as good as Andrew Jackson in 1828. So we like Ike. Welcome to the age of Ike.